Okay, it looks like it's time for us to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's Northwest ATTC webinar. I'm Jennifer Verbeck, and I'm your host for today. We're excited to have Dr. Brian Hartzler presenting for us today on implementing contingency management. A couple of quick housekeeping things. First, if you have any questions for our presenter, please type them into the chat box at any time. After he's finished speaking, I will read the questions in the order that they were received. You'll also be getting an email at the end of today's webinar that has a link to a survey in it. Please take that survey. It helps us break, bring the content that you're most interested in. That email will also have a link to download the slides from today and a link to our website where you'll be able to find a recording of the webinar and that should be available later this afternoon. Additionally, we'll be sending everyone who attends this live webinar a certificate of attendance and that takes us about a week to get those out. You don't need to do anything to get the certificate unless you're watching this in a group. And in that case, please have someone in the group email us within a business day with the names and email addresses for everyone that wants a certificate. And you'll see our email address up there. It's northwest at attcnetwork.org. Okay, now on to the, the webinar. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brian Hartzler, who is a senior scientist at the University of Washington's Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institute. He also holds an affiliate faculty title within University of Washington Psychology, and he also serves as the director of the Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center. And then with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Great. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Jen. Um, I uh, do serve as the director of the Northwest ATDC, so this uh, webinar series is not foreign to me. I think this is our 35th installment of this monthly series, and I might have even been one of the speakers at the initial the inaugural uh, installment back in January of 2018. So I want to thank Jen and Meg Bruner both for their continuing efforts to serve as the great technical hosts uh, and moderator for this series. I also want to thank all of you that are joining us today from within Health and Human Services Region 10 and even outside of there. I know we reach some folks out there too uh, beyond our, uh, our, our region uh, with this uh, webinar series. So I want to thank you for your time and interest in the topic. Um, hopefully I'm going to click here and then have access to things. Yep, wonderful. So one of the things we're unveiling today is an initial version of a land use acknowledgement and you see it listed there. Uh, we want to thank first uh, advisory board members for our center and others that have provided us input about this. Uh, we do hope to incorporate this in future installments of this series uh, and also at other types of Northwest ATTC sponsored events in the future. Uh, we do try to, I think it's a continuing effort, apply a lens of cultural humility uh, to the work that we do. And our work does intend to principally reach the addiction workforce in a four state region of, that encompasses Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. This area does rest on traditional territories of many indigenous uh, tribal nations. And we hope that you'll join us in supporting efforts to affirm their tribal sovereignty and showing display or showing respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors. I also want to, as a Seattleite uh, and as somebody who works at the University of Washington where our center is located, want to offer a more specific acknowledgement for the land in the greater Seattle area, which is the traditional home of the Duwamish, Muckleshoot, Suquamish, and Tulalip tribal nations. Without them, we wouldn't have access to this beautiful area and the vibrant learning environment at the University of Washington. And I want to thank those original caretakers of this land, including those who are still with us. I think that uh, Jen also, oh, she's already done it, um, has included in the chat box uh, a link. So if you get tired of listening to me today or just have a curiosity about the tribal uh, nations that are associated with your particular locale, you can click on that link and see what tribal nations um, are associated. Uh, with your particular area. With that, I'm going to talk a little bit about, con I'm going to talk a lot about contingency management today. Uh, some people think that this is a, a new thing. I think the way that um, therapies get rebranded these days, maybe it feels like the hot topic or something that's um, new to the scene. It really isn't a new concept. And you know, one of my uh, former mentors, the late Don Kelson, um, 
would, would refer to something like this as old wine and new bottles, which is to say these are great old ideas that are just getting rebranded. So contingency management is a therapeutic approach that's been around for an awful long time and it's pervasive in our culture. Lots of everyday examples, uh, including, you know, if you have pets, for instance, and if ever, um, for instance, um, uh, taught, taught your dog to, to shake your hand or some other um, type of behavior, you've probably used principles of contingency management. If you maybe gave that dog a, a, a treat each time he approached uh, or approximated that behavior. Uh, also with our children, if you reinforce your children for contributing to the household through, through doing chores in exchange for an allowance, you're using principles of contingency management. So I think those are probably ways, even if you didn't know it, that you're probably already using contingency management to shape the behavior of those around you. You probably have also had the experience of having others apply contingency management to you. Uh, if you're the driver of a car and have ever had the experience of, uh, of getting reinforced by driving in the HOV, HOV carpool lane, uh, that is the state uh, structuring or, or trying to reinforce you for your behavior. Uh, and I think there's probably other examples out there if you think about um, commercial examples, probably, if you think about airlines and their mileage plans or credit card companies in their rebate programs. Those are uh, businesses that are trying to shape, use contingency management to shape your behavior as a consumer. So again, I just you know, want, to, want to make sure that, that people recognize that this is uh, a pervasive uh, and longstanding therapeutic appro um, uh, approach that really touches lots of us in lots of areas of our lives. If we come back to kind of the topic of the day or the focus of the day and think about addiction treatment, what we're really thinking about here is how do we use rewards to shape our clients' behavior so, so we can increase their treatment adherence? And we wanna do that by selecting um, treatment adherent behaviors that we want to increase the frequency of. So things like abstaining from uh, substances of abuse, taking medications as prescribed, uh, attending scheduled uh, therapy visits. These are things that we would, I think, generally agree are things that we want to increase the frequency of. So those are some common everyday examples uh, of contingency management, as well as some applied to the specific context of addiction treatment. I also want to offer a little bit more of a formal definition. This is attributed to Nancy Petrie, who we lost a couple of years ago, but what was one, who was who is sorely missed and one of our contemporary leaders in the field of contingency management. You can see that she is talking about a behavior therapy in which we reinforce or reward individuals for evidence of positive behavioral change. And evidence is really important. They need to demonstrate it. We need to be able to observe these changes. Um, again, I, maybe I'm just a simple guy and I like to just kind of um, uh, use it common everyday language for this stuff. I think what we're talking about is really trying to, to help people build new habits. And when we think about contingency management, what we're really doing is using valued reinforcers to prompt that client to start up a staircase so they can achieve their long-term goals. The hope is that along the way, they will start to climb those stairs of their own accord and where kind of sources of intrinsic motivation will take over to carry them forward. But as an, oftentimes as an initial engagement strategy, what we're doing is helping, the, helping nudge them a little bit to start that climb up the initial stairs. So this is a longstanding uh, therapeutic approach. It did originate from some agricultural notions about how we um, motivate people or motivate even things. Um, so whether you might use a carrot or a stick, carrot as uh, reinforcement, positive reinforcement, and a stick is punishment. Those are coming, stemming from long, long, uh, or, or very old ideas, the Thorndike effect, that would suggest that, you know, behavior that's followed by a pleasant consequence is likely to be repeated. A behavior that's followed by unpleasant consequences is likely to be extinguished or discontinued. We'll come back to the notion of, you know, contemporary notions of uh, uh, the value of a carrot versus a stick here in a moment. But I would say that these ideas, um, we start, started first seeing them emerge in treatment research in the 1970s in opiate treatment programs uh, with uh, Jesse Milby and others coming up with innovative ideas of things like offering a reward of a take-home medication dose as a reinforcer for documented abstinence from opioids. 
Since that time, we've had a proliferation of scientific attention to this, testing diverse applications. I'll talk about some of them today, uh, but uh, no shortage of uh, scientific attention that this was received in the half century since, uh, since those early studies in the 1970s. Even though it feels like this is pretty you know, simple concepts, they can be misapplied and we do have a lot of influences on our culture that like to punish people for one reason or another. Um, I, I think maybe we've all had experience where, where maybe we have punished something or someone and even seen behavior change come of that. And I guess what I would caution about that is even though you might see some initial uh, or immediate change, when you're providing therapeutic services, I, I think there are some longer term repercussions that, that are probably getting set up if one uses punishment with their clients uh, in terms of your relational context with those clients. And so I think what we would want to, I think what I would say today, what you'll hear from me, and I think what most contemporary purveyors of contingency management would say, is that we want to focus on the carrot and reward people or reinforce, use positive reinforcement and not punishment. After 50 years, we've got a lot of different contingency management pro, uh, approaches out there. I think some of the glue that holds them together uh, and again, I want to attribute this to, to the late Nancy Petrie, who uh, published uh, this language uh, uh, about eight years ago. We've got some core tenets that are common to all of these very procedurally diverse approaches for contingency management, but with the glue that holds them all together. We want to make sure that we target a desired and observable treatment adherent behavior that the client can demonstrate. When the client demonstrates that, we want to provide them a tangible reinforcement. We want to do that as, as immediately as we can so that client uh, is able to very clearly and strongly associate their action with the receipt of this, uh, this, this reward. And finally, we want, um, uh, we want to withhold the reinforcement when the client doesn't demonstrate the behavior. Now, that might seem very obvious, but um, you know, philanthropy as being what it is, uh, and I certainly don't want to be down on philanthropy this time of year, uh, yeah, we do have we do have a lot of systems with us uh, in our culture that uh, that try to address needs of people, and I think it's important to to distinguish contingency management from philanthropy. Contingency management is an effort to reward people for demonstrating treatment adherence. I mentioned fifty years of study. This is just a little bit of a illustration of this. It doesn't even get at the work that probably that happened in decades before the 1960s by people, maybe people remember from their psychology, intro to psychology courses, B.F. Skinner and people like that, that were using all kinds of animal models to show how behavior change could occur through reinforcement. We see in the 60s, you know, the, the initial testing of substance use behavior in animal models. In the 70s, we see those initial studies in methadone clinics that I referred to earlier. In the 1980s, uh, a, a gentleman uh, still at the University of Vermont, Steve Higgins, introduced uh, in response to the, the, the cocaine, what we called the cocaine epidemic at the time, uh, the notion of escalating voucher uh, protocols, where you would provide a voucher or some, something like a gift card um, for uh, valued uh, products or services. Um, as the reward, but the idea was in order to perpetuate a, a new habit, you, you needed each time to increase the amount of that. So for instance, you, if you were to give somebody a gift card the first time they provided a cocaine negative urinalysis result, you might give them a $10 gift card the first time, but the next week you might have to raise that to $15, and the third week a $20, and the fourth week a $25. And so um, while this was shown um, quite clearly to be effective, uh, it, it was, it, you can also see how the uh, financial investment can get a little bit out of hand very quickly. And I think that's the challenge, and that's why we see in the 1990s a proliferation of innovations uh, to, to new patient groups, to new target behaviors, trying to find creative ways to use clinic privileges as reinforcers to keep the cost down, and also some uh, uh, some elaboration on different systems of reinforcement, again, to try to make this not only more uh, less costly, but also more logistically um, possible to do 
uh, within routine clinical care. In the 2000s, actually in the year 2000, Nancy Petrie introduced her, through her initial publication of the fishbowl method, uh, kind of a, a raffle-like notion about contingency management where you've got a bowl and the, 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 the reward that people get are prize draws. So they get to draw slips from the bowl. Maybe half of those slips have a socially reinforcing message and the other half uh, are, are denoted to offer you a prize of varying magnitude, maybe a small prize or a medium prize or a large prize that you might win. Um, and that's all an effort to, again, keep the cost down. That's a protocol that's gotten very popular. It was later tested in the 2000s in a large clinical effectiveness trial through the NIDA Clinical Trials Network. Um, and so I think it's one of our most popular protocols today. Um, we also see in the 2000s a lot of workforce surveys, to seeing how the workforce feels about contingency management. I think a lot of those initial surveys showed that there wasn't a lot of awareness or frankly interest in contingency management, particularly rel relative to other well-known empirically supported treatments like motivational interviewing, for instance. So I think we, we started to recognize we've got some barriers to dissemination. And in the 2010s and now even getting into the 2020s, a lot of work now is on implementation studies where we're trying to overcome those barriers. I'm gonna later provide a small scale example of work I did in the early 2010s. Uh, to try to address that in a single site here in Seattle. There's other work that's going on, um, ongoing, uh, and I want to give a call out to my uh, uh, colleagues, Sarah Becker and uh, Brian Garner, and their respective teams at Brown University and Research uh, Triangle Institute for Project Mimic, which is testing implementation strategies to to try to help implement contingency management at 30 opiate treatment programs in the New England region. Uh, there is also ongoing work that, uh, that our Northwest ATTC is doing with the Oregon Health Authority, uh, trying to work with opiate treatment programs in the state of Oregon. So uh, that's just starting now, doing some really excited about some work that we're doing with a clinic in Medford, uh, trying to construct some customized uh, contingency management programming for them. Okay, well, I mentioned half a, half a century of science on this. So if we try to harvest that, um, about a year ago in a review paper, there was 648 unique publications noted um, concerning contingency management applied specifically to addiction treatment settings. So that's an awful lot. I suspect that number is up over 700 by now. Uh, my own review 10 years ago uh, noted more than 200 published trials of efficacy of contingency management being tested for treatment adherence among persons with substance use disorders. Uh, I suspect that number also by now is much larger than that. Uh, even within those 200 published trials, there was very procedurally diverse protocols evidenced. They're most often uh, defined by the type of rewards or reinforcers that are used, whether those are clinic privileges or vouchers like the Steve Higgins work I mentioned or the prize-based method of Nancy Petrie, um, but you know, there, there, there's really no shortage of protocols that have been tested and, and most of them have been shown to be empirically supported. I think what we're also finding from a kind of a big data perspective is that when, when scientists start to aggregate these data sets together and look for moderators uh, in terms of patient demographic or, ec or socioeconomic background attributes, we, we find a real absence of moderators there, which is to say that contingency management seems to work comparably across populations. We also, uh, again, as we continue to look through um, workforce surveys, find that there's, relatively speaking, less awareness and uh, less interest in adoption of contingency management than at many other methods. And so that's why all the more important um, why, why we're getting the word out today and in other places about contingency management. So why not greater dissemination? This is something that clearly works. Um, I think that we fall into this trap, some of us, uh, the treatment researchers, this notion that we wanna find the one perfect solution that can be universally disseminated. Um, it's a tempting way to think about the world and yet I don't think it's very realistic. There's just too many changing circumstances and other things that impact care in the real world. Uh, and so, um, I guess what I would say about this is uh, that rather than fall into this trap, 
of trying to find a singular perfect solution, what we really want to do is remind the treatment community that this is not a seller's market, but rather a buyer's market. So as we go through today, and as you continue to consider contingency management for your own settings, I hope you keep an open mind and think about how contingency management might be crafted in your own setting to, to meet your needs and within the resources that you have. I would also caution against anyone who's coming to you, probably a snake oil salesman selling you something you don't need, who's telling you that there's a single universal solution about how contingency management is implemented. And to do that, I wanna give a, just a little bit of a, a database justification for those comments. So as most implementation scientists do, uh, I'm gonna go up to 30,000 feet um, and think broadly about the, the data that have been collected on contingency management over the last 30 years. Um, to do that, I wanna talk about, uh, I'm gonna use some statistical terms. I just wanna give you kind of a layman's uh, sense of what those are. I'm gonna be talking about effect sizes, which is uh, kind of a statistical term, but it is a, a way that we can across studies uh, calculate the amount of clinical benefit that one might expect patients to receive from, uh, uh, from, from receipt of a given uh, behavior therapy like contingency management. So what you see here is a representation of the last you know, 50 years of contingency management effectiveness data. On the, on the y-axis there on the left, you see um, the, these are uh, fractionated in terms of standard deviations. Uh, and, that's what the, uh, and that's how we think about effect sizes. So what you can do when you've got something that's as well studied as contingency management is, is you can aggregate data from across these trials and start to see, you know, quantify what the, clinical, what the amount of clinical benefit is across a patient population or across a whole set of patient populations can see that uh, statisticians have uh, categorized uh, how, how large um, an effect needs to be to be considered small, medium, or large, and that these all kind of populate around a half a standard deviation or a medium-sized clinical effect. Um, that includes 19 trials of Nancy Petrie's prize-based contingency management where the mean effect size, and again, that, that means we're computing an effect size for each of those trials and then we're taking an average of them, but that comes in at 0.46. So it's broaching that half a standard deviation of clinical benefit. When we look at privilege-based contingency management, and that incorporates a lot of things, but trials that were done in the 80s and 90s primarily, 30 trials looking at things like stepped care programs where people are rewarded with re reduced treatment requirements, access to supplemental services, preferred appointment times, preferred dosing uh, regimens uh, in, in uh, opiate treatment programs uh, specifically. Um, what we find is uh, a mean effect size of 0.52. So again, right at that half a standard deviation of clinical benefit. When we look at the Steve Higgins-based work of 30 trials uh, done in the 90s and uh, into the early 2000s, you get a little higher mean effect size, but it's still pretty darn close. I would say from 30,000 feet that these, the height of these bars are awfully comparable. And I think what, what I hope the takeaway for this would be for those in the treatment community is first off that contingency management works. It's not a panacea. A medium-sized clinical effect should, should not be suggested to be any more significant than it is, but it's helpful. Um, I, I'll just put this in kind of, um, in one of my colleagues' uh, terms, uh, I saw Steve Shopta do a, a talk about a year ago where he talked about this level of clinical benefit. If it were a medication, it would be the standard of care. That's what a medium effect size is worth in the real world. So, uh, I, I do think that this uh, is important to, to reinforce the notion that contingency management works, that it works reliably, and also importantly, that across diverse protocols, it seems to work on average pretty comparably. And that's important to note. So I think when we when we think about what that might mean, I think there may be treatment researchers out there who again are looking for that perfect single solution and maybe they're on the you know left side here thinking a little bit more like the chernobyl side 
of things uh, that, that, that somehow we haven't done, we haven't achieved our goal yet, that we need that one, that one ring to rule them all, that one perfect solution. And, and I guess what I would encourage those in the treatment community to do is maybe think about the right side here. Think, think about the reasons for optimism here. What this means is we really got a lot of options that you can choose from, options that seem to work, again, pretty comparably well. Uh, and I think that opens up all kinds of possibilities for those in the treatment community to customize contingency management to the needs and resources of your setting. I think the two kind of cautions I would offer there, first is that you, know, you, don't, you definitely want to do this in a theoretically sound way. So you want to adhere to those core tenets that I presented earlier. You also want to make sure that the staff delivering this and interacting with the patients are doing it with fidelity. I think if, you, if you're comfortable with those two things and if you're adhering to the core tenants I mentioned earlier, you're probably gonna be in pretty good shape. So on a lark, uh, I, I wrote in uh, innovation adoption into my browser uh, a few days ago and, um, and found a Wordle that came out like this. And I thought, boy, you know, um, how, how would we promote contingency management as, as an approach? And these are the kinds of terms that, that come up um, and as I looked at this, I thought, boy, this sounds familiar. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the name Everett Rogers might, might know him I, I, uh, or, or might know of his work. Uh, I think this is somebody I consider to be the grandfather of the field of implementation science. He was doing a lot of work, cross-disciplinary work, in the latter half of the 20th century in healthcare, in education, in commerce, in agriculture all um, in the direction of trying to figure out how we put new things where they haven't been before. Some of his most poignant examples are about how, how, to, how he convinced Iowa farmers to implement a new, corn, uh, a new seeding approach for their cornfields. That might sound like it's really far afield from uh, the health services that you provide to clients. Um, but again, if, if we kind of think about the common elements here, this is about how we put new things, innovations in the practice. And from Everett Rogers' work, I think one of the things he found in that cross-disciplinary work is that there are five attributes for innovations that help them get more frequently adopted. One of those is that it's clear to the end users that there are advantages for using that adoption. Um, and so, you know, you want to Certainly, uh, in thinking about contingency management from the standpoint of its implementation in addiction care, want to think about what advantages contingency management might have over its absence in, in the services that you currently provide. It is something that's meant to be layered atop your treatment as usual. So it's not asking you to replace things, but you know, again, you want to make sure that it has advantages. You also want to make sure that it's compatible with your systems. So you want to think about where your recurrent contacts between staff and clients currently are and think about how to make contingency program compatible with those. Likewise, and with many things, you want it to not be overly complex or on onerous to do. So you want to make it simple for staff to, to, to do this procedurally, including how they document how it happens. Uh, those are important considerations in crafting contingency management programming. You also want it to be trialable, which is to say that you want to take a period of time in which you can test it out. And I think I tend to use about 90 days as a good window here. That's enough time to, to build some experience on which you can make decisions about potential course corrections. Finally, you want to also have it be observable. That is, you want your, your staff to be able to see the, client, the, the therapeutic benefits that their clients experience through contingency management. We know from studies that that increases adoption uh, interest and attitudes. Uh, you wanna set this up so that there's an opportunity to cheerlead a little bit for, for clients and to uh, have some vicarious enjoyment uh, with their successes. So again, this is a broad view uh, using Everett Rogers uh, framework here from Diffusion of Innovations, but these are things that would uh, in theory, and I think in practice, increase the likelihood or frequency of adoption of something new. 
I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, uh, there are lots of sources of continual change for the treatment community. We recognize what those are. Staffing turnover rates are perpetually difficult uh, for the addiction field. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you also have continuing uh, initiatives and, and requirements for licensure that change and pose challenges for you. Northwest ATTC certainly seeks to help you with those in a broad sense, but that we recognize that's a source of continual change and challenge for the workforce. We also have new treatments coming out all the time and trying to stay on top of those is also a source of continual change. Potential changes in where you get your funding and how much you get are also a uh, source of change. Policy covers a lot, and I'll come back to it in a second, but certainly another arena where we see change that the treatment community encounters. And all of these things I'm mentioning are true in any year, but in 2020, we've obviously had a global pandemic that's been added to the fray as well. And so that's certainly changed many things about how uh, many healthcare providers are working these days. I mentioned policy. There is, for instance, uh, right now, I don't know that everybody knows this, but in August, uh, the Office of the Inspector General under the Trump administration has um, restricted the amount of money that a patient can receive through contingency management. The annual limit is $75 a year per patient, regardless of the source. Uh, I, I'm probably not the only one here today that hopes come June 20th of next year that we'll have lots of uh, policies um, changing or replaced, and maybe this will be one of them, but for the time being, this is the law of the land. It also reflects another circumstance that the treatment committee has to deal with. Um, and and uh, I think that makes the, the importance of customizing things to your needs and resources all the more important. So we come back to that wordle. How can we customize or, or why should we customize? I think we want to do that so that, the, so that things match your needs and resources, but also that, so that you're poised to adapt your programming in response to these perpetually changing circumstances. And so again, like the, the, the one I've underlined there is flexibility, which I think in this context is synonymous with the notion of customization. I want to pivot here and provide you a case example because I'm talking a lot about theory and big big data kinds of notions here. But um, this is some work that I did uh, earlier in the 2010s. It was a single site type three effectiveness implementation hybrid trial. And the, just so people know what that means, that's a trial where you're testing the implementation of a health service. And then you're also testing what kind of resulting clinical effectiveness you saw through that. It was done here in Seattle with Evergreen Treatment Services, a large urban opioid treatment program. At the time, their census was about 1,500 patients and they would enroll about 30 new patients per month. Their historic challenge and the thing that they wanted contingency management to address was difficulty engaging their new patients in what were scheduled as weekly counseling visits or case management. I think there was a mix of counseling and case management that occurred in these appointments. They had a multidisciplinary staff, a large staff of 23 people. Uh, lots of, you know, re really um, clinically astute people doing good work there. I think that's still the case, but it certainly was the case at the time. Uh, lots of enthusiasm to use evidence-based practices. But admittedly, as I think we saw, see in many places, some hesitancy about using contingency management itself. Some, uh, some salient de um, design features of this trial. The contingency management program was customized. It was customized through a process that I'll refer to here as collaborative intervention design. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment or two, but that's uh, essentially the idea of, of shared responsibility between Evergreen Treatment Services and myself, the purveyor in this case, in constructing this programming. Um, so what we did here, um, in addition to giving the clinic lots of um, leeway to customize this to their needs and resources, also designated early a team of internal champions within the setting with whom I met recurrently uh, throughout the project. Um, 
met with them before training was provided to staff and then also as training was occurring with staff to address systems issues so that the clinic when the staff were trained would be um, ready to embark on some uh, implementation of this. The training itself was, um, I think at the time we were trying to approximate the community standard of a two-day workshop for behavior therapy. So it was set up as 16 hours, but we know that the workforce oftentimes likes to have those trainings split up and, uh, and distributed over time. So it was distributed as four half-day workshops. They occurred on site at the clinic. Uh, over the course of four weeks, considerable emphasis on skill development. So this was not me talking at them like I'm talking at you today in a webinar format. Um, this was about uh, using active learning strategies to build their skills. And you do that through providing clinical demonstrations uh, and then giving them behavioral rehearsal opportunities through role plays and other means so that they get a chance to put their feet in the pedals and actually get a chance to kind of ride the bike. We try to do that in ways where there's training wheels, so it's consequence free, but it's really important to have that experiential component in training if you expect people to actually enact new skills in their clinical work. Uh, alongside this, we were also developing what would become a, an on-site contingency management library, and that was to encompass copies of all the training materials, including the recordings of the training sessions themselves, that was so this would be a, a continuing resource to the staff involved if staff had previously trained staff wanted to get a refresher on something or if there was a new staff member that was hired and maybe this was part of their onboarding process. These are materials that were meant to facilitate those processes. Other design features. Uh, <clears throat> there was uh, a 90 day period was designated to uh, engage in provisional implementation. And this was happened soon after training was completed. Uh, I was I remained available for consultation to their staff, to their champions, supervisors, and non-clinical staff during that time. Clinical effectiveness after that 90-day period was determined through independent chart review, and we matched the contingency management exposed patients to uh, historical control patients. They were matched on stage of treatment and uh, a range of demographic variables. And then at the end of all of this, there was a focus group to determine um, whether the leadership of the clinic um, wanted to uh, continue or discontinue their use of this programming based on their own experiences. I want to come back briefly to collaborative intervention design. This is again the idea of sharing responsibility for the development of the contingency management programming. So it's both so it's both so it's both theoretically informed and matched to the settings fiscal and logistical implementation capacities. It's consistent with lots of other good ideas out there. My colleague Sarah Becker at Brown University, I think in a publication, has talked about this being uh, overlapping um, with principles of user-centered product design where you use in, where you involve end users in the development uh, of a product. Leo Cabasa at uh, Washington University and in St. Louis has talked a lot about collaborative intervention planning framework that's a little bit more targeted toward how you can make things culturally responsive to the patient populations that uh, are involved. But like community-based participatory reach, research principles, all of this is about sharing the intellectual content with the people that would use and benefit from it ultimately in the community. I think this is also consistent with something called the dynamic sustainability framework. And I don't wanna belabor this too much, but just to say that I think that there's this traditional view of treatment, uh, treatment development where we think adaptations are a bad thing to be avoided or eliminated. That's really just not a very realistic notion. And I think what the dynamic sustainability framework would advocate about that is that adaptations are inevitable because of all of those changing circumstantial factors that we mentioned earlier. And so what we wanna do is encourage people to engage in ongoing program evaluation to monitor their adaptations and be guided by the evidence that they see in their program evaluation about whether those adaptations work, how well, whether they should be continued or not. So in terms of the contingency management programming in this trial, what they wanted to do was focus on new patients in their first 90 days of treatment. They wanted to focus on target behaviors. Uh, I'm sorry, as, as a target behavior, they wanted to focus on attendance of weekly counseling visits. 
the reinforcers were $10 gift cards or gift cards in $10 increments that they could, they could earn. They also had an idea about single use take home doses, which were technically uh, or, or not typically or historically used with patients at this stage of treatment at that time. So this was controversial, but it was an idea that the leadership of the clinic at that time wanted to pursue and they did uh, incorporate that uh, during those first 90 days. The system itself was not, a, um, was not one of the protocols that you've heard me talk about before, but rather was akin to a token economy. And that's the idea that people could accumulate points and uh, it was up to the client to decide how and when they, they use those points and they could kind of cash them out uh, for gift cards or for uh, a take home dose but it was empowering to the clients in that they not only had choices about how they use those points, but they also got to choose when they use those points. And I think that's, again, important to empower our patients or clients to make good choices and to motivate them to engage in greater treatment adherence. I'll say also that there was a priming element, which is to say that the first time they attended a counseling visit, they, they were immediately eligible for enough points that they could get a gift card. So that's the idea of priming, a, a, a classic feature of many contingency management protocols. There was also an escalating feature. So if they, that was to promote continuity of attendance. So if they attended visits in multiple consecutive weeks, their points would continue to escalate. As with most escalating voucher types of systems, if somebody then missed appointment, they would reset to zero uh, and start earning from there. But that's the programming that was tested. I do want to say just very, very briefly here that fidelity does matter. That's a picture of B.F. Skinner, for those that don't know. And he would say that the way that we carry out positive reinforcement is more important than the amount. And so it is really important that, um, that uh, staff who are delivering this are, are doing it as intended. There are a set of communication-focused um, skills, I guess we call them micro skills, that are important for uh, direct care staff to develop uh, if they're carrying out contingency management programming. We don't have time to go into those today, but a little bit later we are going to be unveiling a promo for an online training that does a deep dive into these. And again, it would be very important and theoretically important to be theoretically sound also about this. If you're going to do contingency management to make sure that your staff is able to uh, perform uh, with consistency, those communication focused kind of fidelity micro skills. So let's talk about the data briefly here. Um, this is a, a, a fidelity scale, uh, what you're seeing here um, for, this, for this trial. Prior to training, at baseline, at post training, and then 90 days later at a follow up, all of these staff engaged in a role play with a standardized patient. That's a, for those that don't know, that's like an actor who portrays a client a scripted character that they've been given. And um, what you're seeing on the y-axis there is the contingency management competency scale. So it's a scale, it's an empirically validated fidelity scale uh, that encompasses those six micro skills that I referenced a moment ago. Each of them is rated on a seven point scale and so you wind up with a total score of up to 42. You see a dotted line in the middle there that also re re uh, re represents uh, a clinical competency threshold. So what you can see is on average, the staff at baseline or uh, pre-training wasn't, wasn't particularly skillful at this and we wouldn't have expected them to be because they weren't yet trained in it. What we did find after training was a pretty large effect. And again, the D there represents an effect size. So if 0.5 is a medium effect, uh, something over two is quite large. So we had a big impact on the behavior, a very successful training. I'll say in addition to the average that you see here that all of the staff that were trained got above that clinical competency threshold and remained there at follow up. And I think that's as the, the trainer involved here, that's the thing that I found um, uh, the, the greatest source of optimism was that not only did they build skills, but they were able to maintain them in the absence of additional training over 90 days. If we look at their attitudes, this is a single item survey, uh, single survey item about adoption readiness. It's scored on a five point scale and you can see prior to training, people are kind of ambivalent, right? Around the middle of that scale on average, but as they participate in training and, and conclude training, 
you see a full point increase on average. So getting quite a bit more ready or uh, interested in adopting contingency management. And then importantly, see 90 days later that their implementation experience has cemented that. And in fact, their adoption readiness continues to grow. Was it clinically effective? Well, that's probably the most important uh, eventual uh, outcome that we're all interested in. Uh, so when we compare against these 111 historical controls and we look at continuity of attendance as represented by the number of consecutive weeks of attendance, we see on average for the historical controls that was about two and a half. Among those exposed to contingency management during the trial implementation period, we see of those 106 people, the average goes up to nearly four. So this is a pretty substantial increase. When we compute an effect size, we see it comes out at 0.53, which again is right at that half a standard deviation of clinical benefit that you've heard me talk about um, ad nauseum today. What that means in practical terms or what it means for this particular clinic was a 16% increase in their overall counseling attendance among new patients during this 90 day period. Now, is that uh, important enough? Is it uh, worth all the time and effort involved? That's a question for the leadership of the clinic and that would be a question for any of you out there. But again, I want to kind of underscore here that what we've got is through one trial of collaboratively designed contingency management uh, that was not done in the context of, you know, research assistance and all kinds of federal monies being thrown at them, but rather was delivered by workforce members of the community treatment organization with the clinic's own resources, we approximated the same level of clinical effectiveness that we saw in these other 79 collective trials of prize, privilege, and voucher-based contingency management. So this was great work at Evergreen Treatment Services, but I think it's work that could be replicated elsewhere. And I think part of what made it work was that this programming was something that they helped to design so that it fit their implementation capacity from a fiscal and logistical standpoint. What happened next? They had an option whether they were going to continue or discontinue this. Uh, some of these, uh, for sake of time, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, but uh, I'll say that they did decide to sustain this programming as part of their routine care. Uh, lots of positive qualitative data about this in the publications you see listed there. They did decide to amend some features. They got rid of that take-home dose uh, option and replaced it with some, some other rewards, including uh, offering people uh, uh, a, the option of using points toward uh, a uh, take-home dose lockbox. That's something that patients would otherwise have to purchase for themselves. And it was something that I think they, could, they were able to buy in bulk and maybe even save a little bit of money that way. Um, but that was a great uh, idea that came from one of their own patients. And um, that again kind of reinforces the idea of bringing in a lot of different perspectives about how to craft contingency management for your setting. In terms of this setting, uh, I continued to stay in touch after the trial with clinic leaders and asked them at about, you know, six month intervals or so for a couple of years thereafter if they were still using contingency management. All of their reports were yes for more than two years after the trial. So I think this is what's possible to sustain programming. That's what we all want. It's fine to demonstrate something in the short term, but we wanna help people build and then sustain new practices in their, in their clinics. And that happened here. And again, I think part of that was that they, there was a sense of ownership that they had helped to build this. They did integrate that contingency management library into uh, a core part of their onboarding for all new staff. And during this couple year period post trial, they, uh, this was a, an organization that otherwise expanded to include two additional sites. They not only introduced the contingency management program in at both of those sites, I think they did a version of the collaborative intervention design process with the staff at those new sites to really even further tailor the, the programming to those new sites. So it was a great uh, uh, replication, if you will. I think for sake of time, I'm gonna skip through these. This is some qualitative data, but I think all of the reviews were really quite positive. This kind of ties back into some of the Everett Rogers stuff that we were talking about earlier, in terms of them seeing relative advantages, 
in terms of seeing compatibility, uh, in terms of seeing, uh, valuing the simplicity of procedures rather than complexity, in terms of this trial period being a useful time for them to use their own experience to make course corrections, and in terms of being able to see the benefits of their clients um, experienced. And so I guess what I'll say as I leave those slides is that again, these slides are going to be available uh, on the Northwest APTC website, uh, as well as recording, of course, but also that all of the data that were on those slides are available in publications that are freely available. So I want to, I want to take the last few minutes here to talk about tips for customizing your own programming. And I think there's four main features of contingency management that we want to think about. One is the clients, uh, client population that you, um, that you focus on. And, you know, my best tips there are that you, you certainly want to, you want to choose a well-defined population or subgroup. The size of that group is probably going to have something to do with how much this costs and how, uh, how big it becomes as part of your program. But you want to have a well-defined group. You want them to be people for whom you want to use contingency management to increase their adherence. Um, it's, it's always interesting to see sometimes people feel like they want to apply contingency management to the people who are already doing well in treatment. Those are actually people that, that you don't need to apply your resources to in this way. You want to focus on the people who are struggling in some way where you can use contingency management to, to help them and to increase their treatment adherence. Uh, and finally, you know, uh, I, I want to give a couple of examples here of just prior work. Um, I remember a, a group uh, in, in Baltimore, an opiate treatment program there that I visited about a, a, a decade ago now, that wanted to engage in stepped care uh, version of contingency management. So that was the idea that people would be rewarded by progressively reduced treatment requirements uh, and, uh, as a reward for their treatment adherence. That was something that made perfect sense for them to apply to their full census. And so it was something that was put in systematically to address all patients as they came into the clinic as a form of contingency management. A, a very different example is a group at the San Antonio VA uh, that wanted to focus on a very specific and smaller population of pregnant and parenting women who uh, historically had not engaged very well both in their addiction care, but also in, in their necessary prenatal care. So they wanted to use prize-based contingency management to do that, to, engage, uh, to, to improve uh, not only their uh, uh, adherence to their opioid agonist medication, uh, but also to the receipt of prenatal care. And I think because they chose a smaller group, they were really able to do that in an effective way that, that lavished all kinds of um, nice prizes and tailored prizes for that group of pregnant and parenting women. The second modifiable feature or thing that you would uh, modify uh, in customizing uh, programming for your particular setting is the target behavior. And that's kind of linked to the population. Some very common things are, you know, attendance of visits or abstinence of, uh, from a particular substance or all substances, um, ad adherence uh, to medications that are prescribed. All of these things are observable. They're not rely reliant on client report, which is something you always want to stay away from. They're also very clear and they have a binary outcome. And so, um, you know, that's uh, something that, that that's very important and, and that you want to you always want to keep in mind is the clarity with which something you want to choose something that, that either does or doesn't occur. You also want to choose something that's clinically meaningful and predictive of success. And so again, that's the, the work that we're doing with the Oregon Health Authority as one example. I, I think they are choosing to focus on stimulant use and they are going to um, monitor that through weekly urinalysis results. So that's one example of ongoing work and Certainly there are many others that, um, that you'd want to think about as you customize this for your own setting. In terms of reinforcers themselves, you know, lots of, lots of things are probably good ideas, but the best thing to do is to ask your clients about what they value. And you can probably do that through a variety of, uh, variety of means. You can use surveys, you could do straw polls at the end of your groups. Many treatment organizations have a patient advisory board. That might be a great source of ideas as well. But, you know, just ask them what they value. 
um, ask them what would be good reinforcers or what would um, motivate them uh, to make changes about treatment adherence. It's also good to embed some choices in there. Uh, nobody, uh, you, you, can't, you can't offer everybody the same thing and have it be equally valuable to all individuals. So if you build in some, some freedom of choice, that's going to raise the incentive magnitude for everybody involved. I'll use one example of a rural clinic that I visited about a decade ago in New England uh, that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it was in the southeastern United States. Um, but their biggest issue was transportation to and from the clinic because it was in a rural area. And so they had some clients that had cars and some, some that did not have vehicles. And they found their most popular uh, and most important reinforcers to include were bus passes and gas cards for those particular individuals. So that's just, you know, again, one example. In terms of reinforcement systems, you know, I think that, you, again, you've heard me say this earlier today, you want to keep it simple. You also want to make use of your existing recurrent contacts between staff and clients. You want to think about your other systems involved, both your billing and accounting system, because you're going to be purchasing and then distributing and having to account for material rewards and when they get replenished and those kinds of things. Oftentimes it's helpful to have a non-clinical person that's in charge of that, that's maybe a little bit more used to bookkeeping types of activities. You also wanna think about your documentation system. So how it is that you are going to help your, uh, your staff um, easily document what they're doing. I know the clinic that I worked with, it was very important to amend, for instance, the uh, electronic medical records so that they were able to uh, simply document when and what a given client had earned in terms of a reward. And again, the big me message there is keep things simple for your staff. Uh, these are just additional uh, considerations that anyone would have for any kind of systems change effort. You wanna elicit a variety of perspectives. You wanna collect baseline information about the clinical challenge you, you're trying to address. And if you do that effectively, and if you gather that data, you should be able to determine with some precision what a half a standard deviation of clinical benefit would be. So I encourage those of you in position to do program evaluation to think about that because you can probably forecast what kind of impact you could see in your program. You wanna again, start small with a provisional period, build on initial successes and make course corrections. And you wanna utilize available resources. And uh, we're gonna talk, a, or I guess we're gonna do a promo here in a second for uh, a resource that the Northwest ATTC has. I'll get to it in just a second here. Just wanna briefly acknowledge all of the people that have helped uh, contribute to the work that uh, I presented earlier at NIDA for the grant funding uh, for that career development award, as well as my mentors, Don Carlson and Dennis Donovan on that award other staff, both on the project and at Evergreen Treatment Services. And also with respect to the product that you'll see a promo for here in a second is um, funding from SAMHSA for our Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center, as well as Meg, Aaron, and Susan, who all at different times and in different ways contributed to the development of the online training that you'll see a promo here for a second. It is contained in SAMHSA's Healthy Knowledge uh, repository, which is means it's open source and freely available to all of you. It is called Contingency Management for Healthcare Organizations. It does have CEUs attached. There's different modules for decision makers and clinical supervisors and direct care staff. And so I would encourage any of you that are interested to go in and look up the module that seems to fit your particular uh, role in your agency. And we're going to let this run for about 90 seconds. And when it concludes, we'll maybe take a question or two with any time that's left. The Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center has developed a new online training called Contingency Management for Healthcare Settings. The training features separate modules for each of the three common personnel roles in healthcare organizations decision makers, clinical supervisors, and direct care staff. These self-paced modules provide an introduction to contingency management, or CM, that describes its core elements, scientifically supported systems, and how it can be used in healthcare settings to have a positive impact on clients. 
they also offer ways to effectively address common concerns that may arise during implementation. Each module features unique content on how each role can successfully integrate CM into their program. Decision makers will explore how CM can be customized to suit the needs of their organization and build their own CM programming. Clinical supervisors are provided a toolkit of active learning exercises to use with their staff and shown methods of monitoring fidelity and conducting program evaluation. Direct care staff are taken through clinical demonstrations of the six communication micro skills necessary for delivering CM to clients and given a series of role plays they can use to practice with a partner. Organizations can use this training as a bridge to more intensive technical assistance as they implement CM programming that will help ensure their client's success. Take the course today by visiting attcnetwork.org slash northwest dash cm Great, thank you, Brian. We appreciate you uh, taking time to speak with us today. It looks like we're a little short on time for questions. Um, so I just wanna invite people to visit our website and um, we have that course available online as well as some- The Northwest courses. Let's see. <laughs> and also, uh, if you could take a moment to fill out our survey for today's webinar, we would really appreciate that. Um, We'll also be uh, doing a webinar on resilience and wellness on December 16th, and you can visit our website and see more details about that. Um, so thank you everyone for taking time with us today, and um, please visit our website under uh, the link that's in the chat box um, for more information and details.